Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate uh, all of you getting on the call uh, this morning or possibly this afternoon, depending upon where you're where you're calling in from. I'm in balmy Chicago today. Uh, I, I'm sitting inside, but I should be doing what Brian's doing, which is sitting outside. Uh, we talked about mm -hmm. having this as a casual conversation, so it's too early to crack open a beer, Brian, but uh, maybe you're still drinking a cup of coffee or something like that. I finished coffee for the day because I'm on the East Coast. I'm I'm in South Georgia where it's sunny and 70 today, so uh, so it's it's a it's a lovely day here. It looks it looks very nice. So, but again, we appreciate everybody getting on the on the call this morning. Uh, I think you're going to find um, the 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 topics this morning that we talk about are going to be somewhat informal, but I think you're going to find them really interesting. Let's start with uh, some introductions, um, and and then we'll we'll kick things off. Uh, my name is Paul Moran. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Turner Mining Group. Um, we are a company that performs contract mining services uh, specifically and solely for the mining industry. So that's where we, uh, that's where we live. That's where we do our work. Uh, that's what we love. That's our passion. And so uh, when it comes to anything related to mining, that's what we like to talk about. Um, I, our guest today is someone that I met via a Zoom call, uh, which really is our life right now, I think for most of us or many of us, um, just a few months ago, but uh, have struck up a, a friendship and um, shared professional uh, information about, about industry. And, and I think you're gonna find uh, Brian's insights um, really useful, not just, not just interesting, but useful. And, and we'll dig into that a little bit more as, as we get going. But with that, I am gonna turn it over to you, Brian. Um, and if you wouldn't mind providing an introduction of yourself and, and your company and what you guys do, mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think our participants would, would find it really interesting, help get things started. Yeah, sure, uh, happy to do that, Paul. And, um... Brian Moore is my name for, for those of you who may not have uh, read that on the invite. Our company is um, FMI Corporation, uh, headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, and for 60 plus years, our company has has had a singular focus uh, on serving the, the built environment, the construction industry, um, broadly speaking, with two main things that we do. One is investment banking, mergers and acquisitions, um, helping companies buy and sell, transfer stock. Um, make capital uh, capital placements, uh, things like that. And then the other side of the business where I work is is management consulting, where, where we again do we do three basic things uh, for mostly contractors, and that's oriented around you know strategy and strategy development for our clients. Uh, we work with them on leadership and organizational development uh, and organizational structure. And then we've got a practice that's focused on, on performance, which is, you know, think of lean manufacturing, but it's lean construction processes, technology, con, um, compensation, uh, consulting, uh, things, things like that. I've been with the company for, for right at 20 years now. And most of, most of my career, Paul, has been focused on, on the heavy civil highway construction segment and construction materials producers. Uh, as a matter of fact, I started in the, in the construction materials side of this, working with, with aggregates, producers, um, hot mix asphalt producers, ready mix producers, doing, doing market due diligence, supporting um, mergers and acquisitions for the first few years doing that. And then transitioned over to working, working uh, work mostly with heavy civil highway contractors today, although a lot of them are also aggregates producers also. Uh, and most of the work I do is, is solely focused on, on strategy work, which is mm. helping our clients really understand what are the market dynamics that are shaping the market we're in, what are the future trends, how do we make, how do we position ourselves long term, and, and really advising clients on, on on how do they need to to, to organize their business and, and think long term. So we're picking our heads up out of, out of today's business operation and looking over the horizon is sort of the way the way the way we think of that. And, and to sort of summarize sort of what we do, you know, we, we, we always talk about our, our purpose um, in, in our organization is, is to be the most influential advisor in, in our industry and, and to catalyze exceptional performance. We work with great companies to do better things, uh, in essence, the way we like to think about that. Got it. Well, I think, Brian, first of all, thanks for the, for the introduction. And I think one, what you touched on a couple things that, that really interested me and actually is, is, is really the reason for, for, 
Turner, you know, having an interest in, in connecting with you to do this webinar. And that is, when I listened to your presentation, I think it was back in August, um, and it was called, I think it was called Paving the Road to Success um, in These Uncertain Times, especially for the infrastructure market. And I think what, what I found so helpful personally, and I, and I hope our, you know, participants today find, find you know, this conversation uh, useful is that not only did you share your insights and your, your, you know, what you and your team have done in terms of research and data and, and trying to pick out trends, but then you share ideas on you know, how to respond to those trends and, and what to do. And, and, and so you go that extra step. And, and I think I found that very interesting. And so when I think about the purpose of today's call and why we're here is, I think if you can, if you can not only share your insights, but then also give us, you know, what does that mean to those of us who are in the industry? And, and, and how should we think about responding um, in uncertain times? How do we bring certainty to uncertain times? And, and, and so to, you know, to the extent that you, you have thoughts and ideas on that, please share those with the group. You know, the, our audience is, is made up of a lot of the uh, uh, people that are, uh, are on that producer side, you know, cement, aggregates, mining, you know, raw materials, and, and we're the ones that feed those industries that, that you're talking about. And so mm -hmm. it, it helps us to understand that. So anyways, with that, I, I, again, I, I appreciate the intro. Uh, one last logistical point here for those that are listening, we, we'd love to get your questions. This is gonna be initially just a conversation between Brian and myself and, and just kind of picking Brian's brain a little bit. But, but really we'd love to get questions from, from those of you who are listening in today and, and watching. Um, there should be, I believe, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screens, an opportunity to click on a Q&A. You can submit questions during, you know, our discussions. And then, you know, we tend to, we, our goal is to, you know, wrap up within 20 or 30 minutes of some discussion and then leave it open to questions. And uh, we probably will be about 50 minutes on the call, um, a little bit longer if necessary. But um, so with that said, Brian, <laughs> The, uh, the, the, the $64,000 question is, we, 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 we thought maybe we'd know we'd, who our president would be at this point. Uh, that, was the, that was the intention of having the call right after the election. And you advised me, uh, this was, I think, 90 days ago, that we probably won't know uh, the day after the election. And sure enough, you were right. So I guess let me start by just asking you, you know, I've, I've read industry articles that have said, hey, there's advantages and disadvantages to both candidates. In other words, if, if Trump stays in office, there's advantages to the industry, to heavy civil, um, and there's disadvantages. And I've read the same thing about Biden, uh, that you know, if Biden gets elected, there's some advantages and disadvantages. Can you, you know, to the extent that your team has done you know, research on, on, on predicting what it will mean for industry, especially heavy civil. Mm -hmm. Can you share some initial thoughts with us? Sure, Dan. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting, Paul, because probably back in the spring is when people really started to ask that, that specific question, what's the election going to mean for, for the construction industry broadly and, and, and the particular interest on, on the, the heavy civil, which has a significant component that's, that's publicly funded. I mean, what, what's that going to mean for the heavy civil uh, arena? And, and we asked our, our research team to go back and look historically and, and just help us understand the impact of presidential elections on, uh, on total spending in those segments. And, and what does that mean, particularly when there's, when there's a change for, of parties in, in the White House? And oddly enough, what, what they went back and found is it bears almost no impact. <laughs> it has very little correlation over time. And, and, and it really makes sense when you, when you go back and, and look historically at, at the growth of, of, of the heavy civil segments and, and, and to sort of define what we mean by the heavy civil segments. It, it's, the, it's the segments you would think about. It, it's, it's, it's highways and streets and bridges. Um, we, it, it doesn't include in the categorization of the numbers, site contracting, site development work, because that's categorized with either residential or commercial or, or other segments. But you know, but we also include 
dams, ports, airports, railroads, all those sorts of things. And, and then there's a, there's a significant public spending component of that. And the conventional wisdom would be that uh, the, the Democrat Party and Democrat, Democrat um, White House uh, would, would lead more investment in infrastructure, more, more, in, more spending on, on public projects and things of that nature. But what we find is the, over, the overriding factor of that really is the, the long-term federal programs, right? the, the, the six-year federal programs that, that, are, that are focused on, on highways and bridges and, and federal infrastructure really sort of, sort of supersede what, what a specific particular White House um, um, would, would, would want to do. The, um, the, big, the big sort of tell on that was when, when Trump came into office, if you'll remember, one of his, one of his big um, initiatives was to spend a trillion dollars on, on infrastructure. You guys remember that? I mean, it was a trillion dollars on infrastructure. And do you know how much of that actually got done? None of it. None of it got done. It never, it never happened because, because it requires the White House in concert with with, with the, uh, the the Congress and, and with the Senate. And and as I had this conversation this morning with with the guy who heads our, our research department up, and, and we were sort of chuckling about the fact that we still don't know who's who's going to you know exactly what the makeup in Washington is going to be. And he said, but you know, he said, Brian, it really doesn't matter um, because. If you look historically, you know, those those segments, which is one of the reasons they're so attractive, the heavy civil segments are so attractive to a lot of people because they don't move a lot. They never have great big ups. They never have great big downs. Um, and, and so they, they usually fluctuate within a small band uh, over time, and, and it operates more like a bond market as opposed to the other construction segments, which have, you know, are much more cyclical uh, in nature. So sort of circling back to, to what do we think this is going to mean? Is we, we, we think that, that the one thing that, that really matters now, or at least it'll matter very soon once we get some clarity, is that we have clarity. Right? And, and so, so, you know, state DOTs and people who are making long term investment uh, really count on clarity of, of, of the future to be able to, to have those long programs to, to know what their funding is going to be so they can actually, actually develop their, their longer term programs. Uh, the, the other side of that, of that is you know, that, that now that the politics of, a, of, a, um, of an election year are out of the way or, or soon getting out of the way, the expectation that some of the stimulus spending coming out of Washington focused on the infrastructure market can now get done. May not get done in, in, in huge numbers. I mean, the things that people were hoping for back in, in, in summer and spring would, you know, that, that we would go spend – um, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars on, on federal infrastructure programs to boost the, the economy. That's not going to happen. We don't, we, we don't think it's, it's going to happen, but, but some smaller stuff can, can get done in the meantime. Uh, and, and that's what we're basing our forecast around. And that was the assumed uh, expectations going into this. And now it looks like given the tightness of, of the, of the electorate, no matter which party wins, you know, each of those branches, the tightness of it, means that, that much more moderation is likely in store when, once we can get the politics out of the way. So it's interesting, really. So what, what I hear you saying, if I understood it correctly, is, is that it's, it's really not from your analysis, it's not so much who wins the White House as opposed to just getting clarity and certainty that, okay, that, well, not decision, but that outcome has now happened. Mm -hmm. And yep. it's, it's behind us and everybody can think about moving forward and start planning accordingly. Regardless, yeah, regardless and, and Congress of can now, yeah, exactly. And now, now Congress can get, because you think about you know, in this year, and we talked about this before, the FAST Act, which is the federal highway program, which is about a $55 billion a year program now, which expired at the end of October. It's a, it's a six year program. It expired at the end of, uh, end of October. Congress is supposed to have a renewal package uh, in place before that. Couldn't get it done because of the politics of an election year. That's one of the big reasons. So they had to put a, forth a one-year extension on that, which means that state DOTs who develop their two- and three-year long programs based on what they're expecting from, from, uh, from, from the federal program can only plan a year out. So those long-term projects have to sort of be pushed aside uh, or, or delayed a little bit. And so now that the politics are aside, Congress can go back to work now, getting a long-term replacement for that federal program that, that gives that gives um, state and, and and federal agencies more clarity on what their long-term funding is going to be, and th and that will be an, an uptick because everyone, most everyone on both sides of this, we're looking to have an increase in the Fast Act, right, in in Washington, you know, depending on 
a lot of specifics around that, but there was almost no circumstance in which it stayed the same or, or went down. And so now that the politics are behind, we can we can look towards getting that renewal sometime next year, and it will be uh, an uptick in in highway um, spending with this next package uh, that, that comes out presumably next year. Now that now that uh, now that there's the dust is settling in, in Washington. So you when you talk about the Fast Act, so so I've read that both Trump and I do remember him talking about the two trillion dollar you know infrastructure spending uh, initiative and. I've read that Biden has a two million or I'm sorry, two trillion dollar infrastructure spending initiative that he plans to implement if he is finally elected. Uh, I guess my question would be: Is the, is there a difference? Between, is the Fast Act just a portion of that, or is that separate from this sort of overreaching two trillion dollar spending package yeah. that they're both talking about? It is separate. So, so the, the the FAST Act really is just sort of the name they, they give to the Federal Highway Transportation Package. It's a six-year package. It's funded uh, primarily by motor fuels taxes um, uh, that the, the Federal Highway uh, Federal Highway Administration uh, collects, um, and and theoretically it's funded by that. But there's there's usually some other funding that has to go into that as well. And so that's the that's the sort of base base number of spending, and, and it's about it's about 50 some odd billion uh, per year uh, over a five year plan was, was the fast act. The expectation is that the next one will be a bump up to about 60 billion or so over a five year period, uh, which will be a, a pretty good a pretty good boost in, in the highway program. The other sort of large stimulus investment that, that you hear you know, Trump and, and Biden talking about a, a trillion or so dollars of of infrastructure investment. When you when you peel away the layers of all that, how much of that's actually construction that, that we would care about? Not as not enough not enough of it. You see ingest, in, investment in, in 5G infrastructure. Yeah. Right? You see investment in in IT infrastructure, uh, and, and so it doesn't translate in the uh, in the dollars that we really um, we care about it. But, but it's not it's not the stuff that impacts our industry as as as, as much as the headline makes it appear. Yeah, I know. In, I know in Biden's package, he talks a lot about some of the green initiatives, which, yeah, I don't really think would would impact us as favorably as we we would like. Uh, Agreed. But, anyways, yeah. so again, going back to this idea, then that that regardless of who you know gains office, whether the Republicans, you know, and Trump keeps the presidency or it goes to Biden, you know the 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 impact it's it's more about just let's get a decision and let's move on so but when you look back at 2020 and and this sort of ties into another topic that obviously is in all, all of our minds is covid-19 and the impact that it's had on our on our industry uh, and and really just our economy in general and and how that impacts all the different segments of industry but my my question and, and just sort of curiosity is what have you seen when you look back at 2020? I, I wanna talk about 2021 and, and the future here in a little bit, but when you look at 2020, what impact has, has COVID had either directly or indirectly on the industry? Because I know as a, as a player in the industry, as a services provider, quite frankly, even though we are deemed an essential industry, we felt an impact. I mean, we, we have mm -hmm. felt, you know, in the, in the, in the late uh, second quarter and third quarter, we felt like projects were being delayed, spending that we thought was going to mm -hmm. happen, capital spending that we thought was going to happen either got canceled or delayed or what do you, what's your mm -hmm. research showing for 2020 in the impact of COVID in our industry? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, the, there were a lot of immediate impacts. You know, if we if we think about sort of the line of demarcation being March fifteenth, I mean that, that's kind of the the, the it's, it's not a very specific date, uh, or it's a specific date around a, a, some unspecific um, um, times of, of when the, the 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 U.S. basically went on, on lockdown shortly after that. And and the very first things were you know, just sort of a complete shutdown of almost all economic activity. It seems like, um, and with construction coming back fairly quickly in most places because it was deemed essential. And, and in fact, 
in a lot of places, a lot of construction was expedited because, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of other stuff happening. Most of us were staying at home, so it allowed construction to pick up more quickly. And for a lot of our clients, I thought, hey, that's great. You know, we're, we're able to take what, what was going to be a, a 12-month highway project and turn it into three months because there's no one on the, on the street, no one on the road, so we can get things done much more quickly. Um, the problem is, after a few months' time, we begin, you know, plus there's also productivity impacts because of all the COVID requirements. And, and that was generally um, minor, uh, in essence. Um, but we started to see the economic impacts creep in a few months later on when we started to really be able to quantify just what's being, just what level of, of GDP um, reduction we were starting to see. I and mean, we fell off a cliff uh, from, from a GD stand, GDP standpoint. And while that, that makes headlines in the Wall Street Journal, and people, a lot of people look at that as sort of from an aseptic standpoint, who cares about GDP that doesn't impact my business, except the fact that GDP is an accumulation of all business activity. So there, every business has a small share of that, in essence. We also, also saw significant drop in, in tax, uh, tax receipts, like motor fuels taxes, uh, corporate taxes, local restaurant taxes, hotel motel taxes, your airline fees, you know, cruise ships at stationary, still sit say, stationary for, for months on end. And so the need for infrastructure and for cruise ship terminals, for airport infrastructure, uh, the funding around that infrastructure, the funding around highways just basically was, was not entirely cut off, but dramatically cut off for a period of, of months on end. And so the declines into these agencies and these private entities that, that 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 fund future capital expansion really made them go go to go go back to their um, um to their financial advisor and say what do we do right i mean because that doesn't just translate into let's just stop spending for a few months that impacts us for years in our capital planning and thinking and you can look at some very large um, multi-billion dollar projects that were public private ventures uh, particularly around airports uh, funded by concessions going forward you think JFK, for instance, you know, it was one of twenty plus billion dollar project. But when you when you talk about an almost stoppage of concessions, a stoppage of airport fees, and a significant decline in these fees going forward, that project no longer makes financial sense. That's a significant impact on spending. From a commercial market, you know, the commercial construction markets. Most most projects that were in process or, or or close in process continued on, right? I mean, it takes dire circumstances to stop a project that's that's that's, that's part ways through. But new projects, new projects starting, you know, there 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 was you know through the summer and late summer and into the fall, we saw a lot of projects being delayed, postponed, pushed off. Sort of what you're talking about, which which was really. So let's buy a little time until we can get a little more clarity on what the long-term financial implications from COVID and the economy are going to be. <clears throat> Our conventional wisdom has told us, looking at past recessions, that project delays a large part, por a large part of a large portion of the project delays ultimately turn into project cancellations. The delays are really sort of buying time until we can rework the numbers and see if they work. And that some share of them will come back or go forward in a smaller amount. But we didn't just delay it just to delay it. It was delayed because there's a financial issue uh, behind that. And so while we still don't fully know what the impact is going to be, we, we've got our forecast, we've got our metrics, we know our numbers um, around that. We, we still don't fully know what the impact may be from future declines. Um, if, if there's something else in the future that, that, that we can't quite, quite bake into it yet. So we saw a complete sort of sort of fall off a cliff, climbing back out, 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 of, out of it, but then we, we, we haven't gotten back up to, to, to sort of full go yet in our industry. And, and, and there's another shoe, I think, to, to fall because the construction industry follows the general economy in the cycles by about 12 to 18 months historically it always does and, and so for a lot of our clients who this summer and fall were saying what are you talking about we still got back like we're good but yeah because you haven't felt the impact of it yet your clients the, the market the commercial you know the, the the gdp falls today we will see the impacts over 12 to 18 months down the road um and and our forecast bears that out and, and that's what we're beginning to see when you start to look at a lot of the metrics about project cancellations delays backlogs that are slipping away um, from clients. That's what, that's what we're beginning to see, the, the beginnings of that. 
So that's, it's interesting. I, I actually had a meeting uh, a month or so ago with a, a senior executive of one of the big global aggregate and cement producers. And you, you had mentioned airports in particular, and they, mm -hmm. uh, they had a client that a couple clients that were on one of the big uh, airport, you know, infrastructure rebuild projects at actually at, at Chicago O'Hare airport. Mm -hmm. And they, saw a definite slowdown in the activity it the project is still it's it's one of those you know multi-billion dollar multi-year you know pr projects they're adding runways but but they felt the impact uh because that project yeah. was slowed down i i think they're still going forward but i guess so along those lines the, the other thing that that is a little bit disconcerting i think for all of us is this resurgence of covid that we're sort of seeing now, you know, towards the end of third quarter and into fourth quarter. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, do you guys, have you guys looked carefully at that to see, is it possible we're going to see another, you know, sort of shutdown if these numbers don't start to, to come down or flatten out? Um, or are you, yeah. are you feeling confident that, look, we, we know um, that, it's the, the numbers are creeping back up again, but I, we think collectively as an economy, we know that that would just do significant damage. And so we're not going to shut down and we're going to figure out how to deal with this and move forward. What, what, what's your guys sense on that? Yeah, the uh, the scenario that, that we're sort of incorporating into into our base forecast and, 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 and we, we've developed three forecasts just just to be clear, we, we think the the base forecast is this is what we think is going to happen. There's a worst case scenario, which, which we we place. There's not a whole lot of likelihood that's going to occur, but we put it out there just in case. And, and then there's there's a, an upside forecast, which I think is, it's more likely than than, than the than the worst case, but but it's still not as not not extremely likely. But our our base case, the assumptions that we're focusing on, does have some second waves of of, of COVID impact from that. But the, the 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 positive side of that, if you want to call it the positive side of it, is there seems to be such a lack of political will to really have a shutdown like like what we saw from an economic standpoint. Government mandated shutdowns we think are less likely. There'll be government man, government mandated restrictions and curtailment, but not the same kind of shutdowns. I just I just personally don't don't see that happening unless we have a dramatic spike in cases. The, the positive news is you know there there continue to be um and and when we built this into our forecast and our our, our best case, our best assumptions around these are that we're, you will see um, improvements in therapeutics. You will see, um, you will, you will see vaccines coming online later this year, early next year. And, and, and the thinking is, is that it doesn't have to reach critical mass um, deployment of vaccines so much as it has to affect the psyche that is out there, right? We, we, we think that has a that has an, a, an upside uh, impact, just having it approved um, and, and being available, even even if you can't go get one, you know that it's out there. It's just kind of a, a curious way to think about that. Um, so, so yes, we, we, we expected fully that, that there would be minor risk, um, um, growth in cases um, over the, over the, uh, through the winter, improvement in therapeutics, um, uh, the availability of, of, of vaccines limited will to, to have government shutdowns, but, but there would be uh, curtailment in, in economic activity through the winter. So you, you had mentioned this a little bit earlier, and, and I want to go back to it because it, you, you talked about, um, you know, the impact of, of tax reductions, tax, you know, gas taxes, you know, fuel surcharges, just the overall economy. And, and, you know, being weak in 2020 because of COVID. And so therefore revenue state and local government revenue has gone down. When you, mm -hmm. when you think about these federal programs like FAST and, and these, you know, if Biden or Trump goes ahead with a $2 trillion, you know, infrastructure spending program, how, do the, does the funding from that ultimately come from state and local governments or you know, with the reduced revenues at the state and local level, obviously that's not good for anybody, but will you still be able, will we still see programs going forward because they're coming from a different funding source, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
Yeah, yeah. There, there's a couple of things to look at that, and if you if you refer back to the, the the webinar you attended back, I think it was August, September, when it is, we 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 pulled some research and, and looked at state resiliency to deal with this, and 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 not every state's the same, and and so for for companies that, that operate across multiple states across the U.S., it really is in, in, in impactful. Really imp is important from a strategy standpoint to think about which states are better positioned to deal with the economic. Um, calamity that, that they're facing mm -hmm. uh, and, and the things you look at is, is what, what's their unemployment liability what, what's what's their their medicaid liability uh what's their what's their economic base what sort of a rainy day fund that they already have in place to be able to stand this uh, withstand this um the stimulus packages and, and you got two things federal programs and then stimulus packages the stimulus packages would not require a local uh, local or, or state government funding for that the FAST Act and whatever it's replaced with the highway program does because that, that requires a local matching. And, and that's part of the challenge is that, that, that there's a concern next year that some of these states who, who have been gutted economically, their tax, their tax revenues, tax receipts have gone way down. They're not positioned well to, to, um, to have matching funding for federal highway in, uh, investment, which is why there, there's a fairly large debate in Washington around making states whole helping them fill in the gaps around that. And, and, and now that the election is over, I think it's a, a lot more, we believe it's a lot more likely there will be some modest um, um, payments made to states to help them shore up their, their financial situation. We don't think it's going to be what the initial ask was, which was to cover all the tax, the, the mm -hmm. tax uh, decline, but the, the, there will be enough of that to make it possible for them to have matching funds for these federal programs. Uh, from a, from a stimulus standpoint, though, it, it really isn't isn't all that um, um, dependent upon upon local funding for that. And quite frankly, <clears throat> you could see you could make the argument that some of that federal, you know, assuming there's a federal stimulus package focused on on infrastructure, that that it would be targeted at some of the worst uh, the worst hit economic uh, areas. I mean, that, that's where it's needed the most, right? I mean, it's, it's right. needed most in in places that, that are hit the hardest. Um, again, politics always plays into that, and, and that's really difficult to sort of you know, sort of cipher, cipher through that. Okay. But, but yes, it's the, the, the bigger impact. Yeah. You know, so, so state tax receipts um, that, that are, that are down now impacts their ability to, to have matching funds for federal programs, but it also impacts their ability to direct, direct investment as well as your, your local, your local municipalities that invest in, in parking structures and, and, and roadway investment and, and building, building, um, 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 new landfills and all these sorts of things are, are impacted by the, the local funding. Okay. So um, I wanted to, I wanted to switch gears a little bit um, and, and talk a little bit about 2021 and the future and, and in mm -hmm. reference specifically to, you know, you, your team at, at FMI, you and your team put out a report that I saw yesterday. I think it's called the heavy civil construction index report, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. I, I had a chance to read through it and it, it's very detailed and, and I thought provided a lot of good information. My thought was, or my question really, and in, in my, my ask is if you could maybe share with the, the folks on the call, you know, just sort of the highlights from the, you know, what that report is, you know, you guys have done it now a couple times, who do you survey and, and what's some of the key takeaways? And then what I thought we could do, you know, after the after today's webinar, maybe it, if it's okay, can we send the participants a copy of that report? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think it's very yep. valuable for anybody in the industry. Yeah. But maybe just shoot. Yeah, we're we're, we're happy to share that. Yeah, absolutely, and, and and happy to happy to share that with anybody that wants. I mean, that's that's the reason we do, we do these publications is is to serve the industry, and and we've done it. Um, I want to think we began it in 2017. I think I can look at look at my math and see exactly when that occurred. But it's a, it's a quarterly publication that we do. It's a lot like other sentiment, sentiment index, which is really gauging um, the the industry's outlook on the the market today compared to last quarter. And so anything above 50 is is seen as um, as optimi optimism. Anything below 50 is pessimism. And as you can imagine, when we did it last quarter, it was terrible. I think it was in the in the 30s at, at that point. Um, which was as low as it had ever been, and, and you can think about think think about it in the summertime. It was really, a, it really was a terrible time to try to gauge sentiment on, on anything because everyone was it was not everyone, but a large swath of the, of, um, of the economy was was in just real uncertainty about the future. 
while we, we came up from that low, it's still below 50, which means the industry still has a negative outlook on the future or not as, not as positive, but just slightly, slightly negative. There's a few big take, and, and so the question was who, who who populates this survey. So we we actually sent it out to a, to a list of it's actually several thousand um, people that we send this to. We get response back from a couple of hundred um, respondents on this, and it's from across all swaths of heavy civil um, site contractors, residential site contractors, commercial site contractors. Um, um, highway contractors, um, people who work across the U.S., people who only work in one region. So it's it's a fairly diverse group of companies uh, who respond to this. All sizes, from small to the biggest of the of the, of the large companies, respond to this. And there, there's it's a fairly quick survey, but but it really is asking a, a handful of questions around around their outlook on some, some specific things or around their the economy where they work. Uh, their 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 perspective on the national economy, their specific segment, uh, the kinds of work they do, and their their outlook whether whether it's better or worse than it was a quarter ago, as well as around productivity, you know, cost of materials and, and, and things like that, and all that factors into with a whole lot of math and hocus pocus <laughs> into the sentiment index that our that our economist prepares out of that. But there's a few specific current events questions that we ask, and and, and so we have this sort of running 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 list about what are the most what are the things that will impact most positively or negatively your outlook on, on the economy, and, and they're exactly what you would think. Things that would impact it most, and, and it's, the, it's sort of the same, same, same things, positive or negative, which is it kind of makes sense. It's the election, the COVID, and the general economy. Okay, no kidding, right? We, we, could, have, we could have expected that. And then there's a whole list of other things that people have on their radar screen. But, but the questions that got, from me at least, the most, so what does that mean? We're asking about um, the, the metric of, of backlog book to burn, which is how quickly are you adding backlog to how quickly are you burning backlog? What's that ratio? And about half the contractors who responded to this said it's down today compared to a year ago, which means we're burning backlog more quickly than we're adding backlog today. And, and that's something that that when 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 we first began sort of the, the, the COVID environment, you know, we, our expectation was you could expect to see that. That's what we expect to see heading into uh, the early stages of a recession. Although we're not predict, predicting long-term recession, but a, a down cycle in the market. That's what you expect. You expect people to see to burn backlog more quickly than, than they're booking it. The other questions were around the competitive landscape, and the questions were, you know, how around how has the, the competitive landscape changed in the, in the last quarter? Seventy-five percent of the companies who responded said they have seen an increase in competition. You know, more than half said they've seen a moderate to significant increase in in number of competitors uh, in their marketplaces. Over half said they've seen bid prices go down, and about a third said they've seen new competitors. New competitors. From outside of their traditional uh, market, come into their marketplace, which which really gives us. You know, we had anecdotally had lots of conversations about what's going on competitively in, in the marketplace. This puts some hard edges around what are we, what are people really seeing in the marketplace, and we're and we're 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 seeing what we expected to see, um, and and the expectation is that that's going to going to um, con continue through uh, into next year. Most respondents also expected 2020 to be an up year from a revenue standpoint. We would too, given how strong we started the market, given what the backlog was at, at the beginning of beginning of the year. The, the next year we would see it would see a, a decline in revenue, a slight decline in revenue. But by 2022, most expect to be sort of back back out of this recession. Our thinking is that's probably optimistic. It's kind of figures, right? I mean, we're, this is an optimistic industry, um, so that kind of makes sense. We then, at, at the tail end of that, we, we put together our detailed forecast for, for the transportation highway segments, which are the biggest segments of, of the, the heavy civil arena. And you're looking at, and and and, and, it, and it really, I mean, it makes logical sense, right? Yeah, our expectation for the uh, for the airport construction, air transportation segment to be down, right? I mean, people aren't flying; they're not going to, even though. Airport projects are ongoing. Large infrastructure airport projects are ongoing, especially ones that have begun. That they're they're smaller than they were. They're, they're delayed a little bit. There's going to be a decline in that for several years um, until we can get a vaccine and people get back to travel. Same thing for water transportation, right? I mean, I mean, although we have um, um, more need to ship from overseas, just in general, you know, we, we've seen this pushback against import importing of goods. We've seen just a general decline in, in, 
uh, in economic activity, and, and so so that 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 is declined uh, somewhat. You think of what's going on in the port industry, I and mean, there's no need to build new new um, ports of call, um, at least not in in the, in the near term, because the cruise industry has suffered. So so those segments are down. Highway, you know, our expectation is that the highway market is going to suffer next year. And the, here's here's why that is. We were we were up in in 2020. Um, because of projects ongoing, states are, are curtailing their, their funding for next year. We don't have any federal program to backfill that. Even if they came back in January and said, let's go get it uh, and, and renew the FAST Act immediately, that takes time. We're not going to get any of that done next year. You're likely at least nine months before any of that would, would begin. And so 2021 is going to be a down year uh, for the, the highway construction market, but we expect it to be back up after that. So it's kind of a short-term blip. The bridge market has been down uh, for, for the last several years. The bridge construction market has been down. Uh, we expect that to, to, to sort of pick up. You know, bridge programs are, are, are necessary and needed, I mean, because there's a lot of press around deficient bridges going forward. We don't say it in, in, our, in, our, in, in this forecast, but, but that's what's all in that, in that uh, heavy highway sentiment um, construction index. The other segments we, we look at is the commercial site construction and the residential co site construction. <clears throat> Commercial site construction is going to follow the commercial markets, which are going to see a, a tough few years, as you, you can expect. Residential, though, is sort of a it's sort of an anomaly. It's kind of an odd market right now. It's a strong market, uh, lots of residential construction ongoing. The expectation is that's not going to see a dramatic decline uh, near term. Although I, I, that's what our economists tell us, but I have sort of a I have a sneaking suspicion that there's a shoe to fall there somehow when you look at the, the, what's going on in the mortgage market right now and, and the amount of mortgages that have been deferred. Um, and, and with no, no recourse uh, from, from lenders, um, that's got to have an impact, we think, um, I believe, in, in the next year or so. Yeah. Yeah, I've kind of wondered. A long about answer that. to your question, though. No, that, no, that's okay. Yeah. And by the way, it, we've got, um, it, if anybody would like to submit a question, by all means do so. Just tab on the Q&A button and you can submit a question. And then we'll, uh, we'll see if we get any questions and, and otherwise uh, begin to wrap up. But you made a comment there that I thought was interesting from the, and I saw it in the HCCI report that um, you're seeing, uh, I think, what'd you call it? The backlog to burn um, mm -hmm. ratio. The book to, book to burn rate, yep. Book, book to burn rate. So basically, if I understand that correctly, you know, as projects are finishing up, their rate of projects to, I'll use the word backfill for lack of a better word, are not, there as strong as they typically are in the past so that you're keeping yep. your backlog full if, if you will going yep. forward the other thing that you yeah, and, and that's declining yep. and that's declining the other thing that's interesting too and I, I we personally have seen it a little bit in our business is it is it does seem that there are more bidders on projects on individual projects because there are fewer projects i'm guessing so mm -hmm. more more yep participants kind of jump in the game when there's fewer to choose from, if you will. Um, yep. I think we've seen, we've personally experienced a little bit of that. Um, sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and check to see if we have any questions. Um, and then I, I do have another question for you and um, gosh, it's, it's already been about 45 minutes. So we'll, we'll definitely wrap up in the next 10 or minutes or so. Um, so question has come in, how have each of your businesses prepared for continued impacts of COVID or potential delay in infrastructure package funding? So um, yeah, do you want to comment on that? So, yeah, yeah. So, and I'll talk about our clients and sort of the way our clients are, are thinking through this. And then, and there's a very, um, a very sort of specific mindset that, that we counsel our clients to think through uh, in, in this sort of this sort of environment. When you get in an environment that has lots of ambiguity, very volatile in, in terms of the information that we're getting, uh, pretty uncertain about, about what's going to happen over the next several years, to build two um, two sort of parallel strategies to deal with that. First is, is is a defensive strategy around what do we do today, given what we know right now. Given what we know about the near-term impacts of, of project project cancellations, project delays, downturn in the marketplace, um, which, which 
and I don't want to I don't want to overstate the downturn in the marketplace because there are lots of places where the market's booming right now. But sort of in general, if you think about if you're in a market that is seeing significant downward downward impacts from COVID, the idea is is to build defensive strategies today. And then think about long term what what's our offensive strategy to play in the market that we're going to see uh, over the next two to three years, which means you have to get some clarity on what that looks like. And so if we if we factor in what our what our best understanding is of what's going to happen from an infrastructure package funding, me, meaning the the fast act or the, the federal highway program and, and, and its subsidiary components, you know, that 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 we know it's going to stay at about the same pace at a minimum. We know it's going to be at about 50 plus, 50 plus billion next year at a minimum, potentially some upside of that. And so we, we, we sort of walk our clients through the, the, the strategy planning of, of building defensive strategy to focus on our business today. What's our offensive strategy to take advantage of any upside to that uh, and, and, and really position ourselves for, for sort of a base case around that as well. The challenge is, you know, that sort of strategy, you know, strategy requires us to make commitments to a, to a, a, an expected future. But what we're asking our clients to do is, is to real build two strategies and have opposing viewpoints uh, about that and be willing to be agile and nimble uh, Mm -hmm. to think through that. So it's, it's a very complicated time to develop strategy for our clients. Not like it was a year ago when, when, when the expectation was steady as she goes, we're we're continuing, continuing to climb up. It's not like we haven't seen this before. I mean, you think back to 2009, 10, 11, it's different, different influencers on the marketplace, right? I mean, it, it was it instigated differently. It happened more slowly, but this is not new. I mean, we, we, we've been through market turmoil before. You know, right. The challenge is if you've got a management team who hasn't, who doesn't know how to think through that, it can be a real, um, it can be a struggle. So I've got one more question, and then you know if we get any others, we can we can uh, hit those before we conclude um, the discussion. But you know, when, when, one thing I've read a lot, just in in general, with the economy and industry is is what are going to be the long term impacts of COVID? What are the what are things that are fundamentally changing? So you know, I'm I'm an eternal optimist. So I believe we're going to get a vaccine. I believe our testing procedures are going to get better. I think we're going to have therapies. That, that will uh, help us get back to a more normal lifestyle. I think the question is uh, uh, when, <laughs> obviously the sooner the better, but, but, but in light of that, even when things do get back to normal, and again, I believe they will get back to some level of normalcy, what will some of the things that will fundamentally have changed in our industry that won't go back? I mean, you know, for example, they talk about, you know, a lot of companies have, you know, people are working remote and a lot of companies have come out and said, we're not going to bring people back. They're going to continue to work remotely. Mm-hmm. When, when you think about heavy mm-hmm. civil, are, are there things mm-hmm. that are going to come out of this whole COVID pandemic experience that are going to fundamentally change how those people in our industry do business? You know, some of what's happened, uh, I think we're, we're seeing a little bit of an acceleration in, in adoption of technology, right, but, but forced by this. Um, not only in, in, in the remote working and, and all that sort of aspect, so, so there's that. Um, there's a little bit of more nimbleness required because of the last six months, and, and that just sort of becomes a now part of our DNA going forward. The interesting thing is, though, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist that we're going to see all these things happen. And, and you hate to say it, but I mean, Americans have a sort of a short memory. <laughs> we go back to what they were doing before. Um, I think we're. I think you're. You're going to see some variations in things that get built. Uh, some way we do businesses, but but at this point, our um, our um, I don't want to call it our conventional wisdom, but our point of view is that we don't see dramatic increases in the way we do business going forward unless unless this thing persists. If this persists uh, and, and ekes through next year, and then I, then I think you're going to see really entrenched sort of doing business this way. People not, not likely to come into the office. People working remotely, even even not even not even in the same city city as, as our employers. Uh, we're, we're, we'll see we'll see more. Um, which which really sort of this sort of technology gives us comfort level with technology, so it allows us then. Because I've had a lot of my clients who who, who were then well, they're more willing to look into rem- robotics and rem- rem- remote remote vehicle uh, remote vehicles and, and and things of that nature. 
but I think I think that's I think that's around the periphery. I think the core of our business, uh, the way we do business, the things that get built, um, impact from COVID is going to be minimal. There are other other impacts and other changes. There are some dramatic changes that are occurring, but they, they were already occurring pre-COVID. Um, yeah. In terms of the things that we're building, right, the technology that's available to us, the autonomous vehicles, right. uh, all those sorts of things were already occurring. Uh, this maybe accelerates our adoption of technology because we're more comfortable with it now than we were six, eight months ago as an industry. Right. Okay. Well, Brian, I think that's it. Uh, we don't have any other questions at this at this point, so we'll go ahead and uh, wrap things up. We will. Uh, we appreciate your first of all getting on the call and sharing your insights with us. Um, I would very I much do. like to send that report out to the participants on the call. So we'll do that after the call. I'll coordinate with you on that. And uh, I think that's basically it. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us and uh, enjoy the the nice weather you're having. Uh, down south, we'll and do uh, we'll do the we'll do the same we'll do the same up north. Enjoy. Okay, thanks, thanks Brian. Talk to you later. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.